Let's find out. Thank Thomas? Um, good evening and thank you all for coming. First, we want to uh, thank uh, Smith customer and lo local musician Monica Pascal, a member of the group Blame Sally, for loaning us her keyboard tonight. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> so, tonight, the Booksmith is very pleased to welcome Ray Manzer and Ben Fong Torres. This time for a talk and book signing to celebrate the publication of The Doors thank you, by The Doors. Along with drummer John Densmore and guitarist Robbie Krieger, UCLA film students Jim Morrison and Ray Manzer formed The Doors in 1965. They went on to become one of the most unique, celebrated, influential, and controversial bands of all time. They also had a lot of really great songs. <laughs> the Doors by The Doors is the first ever book about the band by the band. Joining us tonight are two of the authors of this new book, Ray Manzarek, who played keyboards in the band, and Ben Fong Torres, the legendary rock music writer who was the last journalist to interview Jim Morrison. Please welcome Ray Manzarek and Ben Fong Torres. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Gary. Thanks to uh, Booksmith, uh, and welcome to all of you. Early warning, we, uh, I think you had, what, two, three glasses of Grenache? Yes, <laughs> at least. I had a scotch. <laughs> and then, what, a beer chaser, and then, uh, <laughs> whee! And then the fun started at Olympic across the street. So we're in good shape tonight. So Is we this make, working, do you think? Uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> what the hell is this? Uh, no, we, uh, it's going to be a little loose. In fact, I had noticed that uh, as I was leaving to come here to, to, to set up the thing, we had a 15-second <laughs> meeting about what we would do tonight. Right. So that's how it works tonight. Okay. Um, the book is uh, The Doors by the Doors. I'm proud to have uh, been uh, asked to be part of it and to uh, basically conduct interviews with the surviving doors of which we have one here tonight, and to combine that information along with uh, interviews with Jim Morrison conducted through the years by various parties, including myself. And I'll tell a little bit later on, I hope, about the uh, meeting with Jim in early 1971 that turned out to be uh, the last conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Vanna. Um, <laughs> 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 it's etched in their memories. They have their credit cards ready to go. Now. <laughs> um, uh, and so the, the book was started, uh, I, 
think sometime last year as part of the celebration of 40 years of the Doors, which is amazing when you think back to bands of that era, how many of them warrant this kind of attention now, 40 years later? The Stones, Bob Dylan, The Beatles, The Who, Herman's Hermits, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie and the Dreamers? Dream on? No, no I don't think so. No. So, uh, here we are celebrating one of the truly outstanding bands of the time, and we'll get into that. Why it is that in 2006 uh, we are still talking about and enjoying the music uh, and being moved by the music of the Doors. Uh, Ray Manzarek, of course, was the, really, when you think about the founder of the Doors, there is not, maybe not just one, but he was there on Venice Beach, and he'll tell you that story a little bit later on. Um, the book took shape early this year, from January to March. That's all I was given to uh, write it, uh, report it, and research it, and write it. It got done, thanks to the Doors cooperation, and here it is out. And it's uh, out along with Perception, which is a CD, yep. DVD box set. And there's actually a movie, a feature documentary being made. It didn't make it on time. Uh, by Dick Wolf, the <laughs> creator of the Law and Order, mm -hmm. an ending Law and Order series of uh, crime dramas on television. And there are a couple of other projects too. So this will be the endless celebration of the Doors' 40th anniversary. Uh, <laughs> Ray, I wanted to start the out. Endless celebration. The endless, yes, that's right. I like that. Wasn't that a Doors song? Endless, <laughs> right, exactly. Celebration of the uh, lizard. Celebration. Yes. <laughs> celebration of the library. Um, now, Ray, I was going to just ask you a couple of questions to get us started. Go ahead. Man. All right. Go ahead. Uh, and the first one was your connection to San Francisco from from 40 years ago. You came here in I think early '67. Uh, we were at the UCLA Film School, Jim and I, uh, along with uh, my girlfriend, Dorothy Fujikawa, who, who is, is here now tonight. my wife, Dorothy Manzarek, Low these many years that we've been together. Uh, we would come up here for spring break and um, uh, winter break, which uh, were called, uh, in the Christian tradition of uh, America, were called Easter and um, Christmas, but now we don't, which is like, you know. Have you ever thought of, let me digress just shortly, <laughs> the, fa <laughs> the fact that we, we don't have religious holidays in America. We're not supposed to have religious holidays. You celebrate your religion, that's fine. We have Fourth of July and we have Thanksgiving. We have one day that we take off that is a total Christian holiday, and we close up the banks and everything else on Christmas. Now, why do we, why is Christmas, you know? I mean, I mean, fine, I love the holiday, it's a great holiday, but if I was, you know, an, an, an atheist or something, I would say, uh, we're going to have to stop. Everybody's going to have to work on Christmas <laughs> Day. <laughs> I don't know, you'd probably be killed, but... Uh, that's beside the point. All right, so we come up here, think about that, Christmas and why the banks close and the post office closes, everything closes on Christmas Day, which falls not on a Sunday, but all any day that whenever December 25th is. So Jim and I and Dorothy come up here on uh, uh, spring break and, and winter break and, all, and go over to Berkeley and thought, oh, if only the film school was up here in Berkeley and... We came up here to see Jean Genet's, the uh, beat writer from France, one, one of the beatniks, which you guys, of course, all know about because this is the home of the beatniks. And, you know, Jack Kerouac and Ellen Ginsberg and Gary Snyder and Michael McClure, I play with uh, occasionally doing an evening of piano and uh, poetry, and we do our modern version of cool beat jazz and keyboards and Michael reads his poetry. So we came up to see Jean Genet's Un Chant d'Amour, a notorious homosexual movie, great movie, we just <laughs> as erotic and sensual as it can possibly be. Dorothy and I are on one side watching it, and who is, didn't even know about this, who is sitting over there James Douglas Morrison, at the end of the show, was like, everybody stands up and applauds. We turn around and look at each other, check out who's here. Okay, let's see. There's Jim, there's Ray, there's Dorothy, there's Jim. So San Francisco brought us together intellectually 
uh, Los Angeles brought us together as far as the music is concerned, but uh, you know, our hearts were always, uh, were always up here, and we always wished that the UCLA Film School was the Berkeley Film School, so that we could be up here and partake of that. But if you think about it, on the other hand, then we would have been a San Francisco band, and it wouldn't have been that animosity between Los Angeles and San Francisco that we played off of. Uh, here's a band from L.A., uh, Bill Graham said. We've got a band from Los Angeles, The Doors, on our first gig. And, and the Bill, don't say the, from San Francisco, uh, from Los Angeles, just say The Doors. Well, you, can't you just say, do you have to say from Los Angeles, for Christ's sake? So there was always that, uh, you know, the, the Grateful Dead and the, uh, uh, and the Jefferson Airplane, and who are the other, let's say, uh, Quicksilver Messenger Service, and Steve Miller, and all that, versus the Doors from Los Angeles. And who else? Big Brother. Big, yeah, well, you know. Janice. Janice, of course. Yeah, Janice came up to me and said, Hi, I'm Big, before I knew who she was, Hi, I'm, I'm Big Brother. Said, you don't look like Big Brother. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You, you tell a story about after Bill Graham introduces you as uh, being from Los Angeles, there's still a few seconds before you have to go on stage, you're huddling on stage, and Jim came up with the idea. On Jim how says, let's play, let me see if there's an organ sound on here, you never know, there could be. There's an electric piano, there are other sounds, <coughs> well, there's plenty of other. No. Now that's awful. says, let's play when the music's over. I said, to start the set when the music's over? To start the set? It's like, first of all, they hate us because we're from Los Angeles. He said, no, no, no. I've got that feeling, right? i got a feeling. And I said, all right. He said, put everything you've got into that hand. He's going to go, da 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 and everybody, Robbie, Jim, comes in with a, yeah! And we're into the rhythm of the song, and it's just going, and San Francisco and the Doors were like, that. And stayed that way. The left hand to save the Doors. There it is. Wow. Well, that's the kind of stories that uh, the members of the Doors tell throughout the book. But when people ask, what is so unique about this book? Because Ray has written his own book, Light My Fire. John Densmore, the drummer, wrote his own book, Riders on the Storm. Robbie will probably not write a book anytime soon, but still, he has stories to tell. I think the unique thing about the book, and I'm going to ask Ray for his own thoughts on it, is that this book reaches out to the family for the first time, especially of Jim Morrison. So for the first time ever, the father of Jim Morrison, Admiral George Nee Steve Morrison, talks about his son, because for so long, especially among Doors uh, fans, it was considered, it was thought that Jim was so estranged from his family he never spoke to them, never had contact with them through all the years of the Doors. His rock and roll success years were without his family. Well, literally that was probably true, but on the other side of it, we finally find out that they had emotions, they had thoughts, they reached out to him over those years. And so that's one of the things that we find out from the book. And the other thing too is also, again, shattering some mythology. Uh, which is that I always have someone playing behind me while I talk. Uh, <laughs> oh, Set the mood here, man. <laughs> Please continue. I'm sorry. I'm just. I, I, I'm Josh. Uh, the mythology that the Jim uh, was so erratic in his behavior, uh, his intake of alcohol and drugs, that the man was always pissed off at him. You find out from talking to the guys uh, all these many years later that in fact they really did gel as a musical unit. They loved playing together, and their, their greatest, one of their greatest triumphs was coming full circle in their sixth album, L.A. Woman, going back to the garage in a way by converting their rehearsal space, their offices on Santa Monica, into their final recording studio. And that's where they made L.A. Woman. 
uh, and uh, it was a return to the blues, a return to the R&B sound with which uh, Jim and, and Ray first got together back in college days. And so, uh, given that Ray, now I'll play behind you. Okay. No. Ray, tell me now, or tell us, please, what did you uh, get from the book that you had not seen from other books about the Doors or about Jim Morrison? This is a totally unique book. Uh, it's got, it's Rashomon. What, what you get from my book is the truth. What you get from John Densmore's book is a, uh, a, a psycho, psychodrama of a uh, man of, trying to figure out you know, which side he's on. Um, and Robbie hasn't written a book yet. And, uh, Danny and Danny and Jerry Hopkins wrote No One Here Gets Out Alive. Very good. Everyone's read that one. My book is, the, is, is better than that. But this one is, if you haven't read my book, so you know, what the hell. What difference does it make? I only explain LSD and God. <laughs> no wonder it didn't sell. Uh, but this one is totally unique in that it's got all, it's got, it's Rashomon. It's got all the doors, everybody's got a different take on the story. So you get Jim Morrison and the doors looked at from the perspective of a whole bunch of different people. Did you get that? Good. Ah, you go. Okay. I, I, sometimes I have to hold while the camera... <laughs> okay, good. Anyway, this book is just... Uh, this is terrific. This book is... Uh, I love it. The pictures, the pictures are unbelievable. And the design... Needless to say... Is it, this doesn't work. Yeah. The design... The design is so clean. It's like... You know, Robbie has a 1956 Chevy... Uh, Nomad. You know what the Nomad is? That round, it's a station wagon with that curved back. He, he painted it, interestingly, black and yellow. And here it is. This is Robbie Krieger's, uh, Robbie Krieger's 56 redone Chevy Nomad. Now, I love the cover. It's just so clean and Bauhaus-like. And I, I think that's the important part. The, uh, no offense against anybody intended, but the book company wanted to put a slug of photos across the top of this. And they presented it to us, and I said, Oh, God, no, man, keep the cleanliness. For God's sake, take the photos off. And they said, Well, people won't know what's on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does this say here, for God's sake? It says the doors. What the hell do you think is going to be on the inside? And you see a book this size, you know there's going to be pictures, and all you have to do, well, my God, there are, oh, jeez, there are pictures on the inside. There's all kinds of pictures on the inside. And it's slick, and pictures, and pictures, and pictures, and writing, and pictures, and talking, and pictures, and pictures. So, this, uh, this is a totally unique book, and uh, I don't think we'll ever do another one like this. And this is, this is it. This is, this is the one. So... To, uh, and this is the man who did it, a band. God bless you, man. This guy did a great job. In how, how long? In what, three months? Yeah. <laughs> <Didn't we? laughs> I never saw my wife. I actually forgot what she looked like, even. I have photographs, unfortunately, in my wallet, so that was, that was helpful. Ah, Diane, yeah, there you are. Um, we uh, celebrated the book and the uh, anniversary of The, uh, the Doors by going uh, to Los Angeles, you from Napa and us from, from San Francisco, Noe Valley, down to uh, Sunset Strip, to the Whiskey, where it all began. Actually, also to a little place called the Cat Club, two doors down from the Whiskey, which was the London Fog, where the doors really got their nightclub start uh, in 1965, 66. And then John Densmore, who has sued Ray and uh, Robbie over uh, various things, was uh, put, a, put, put in a bookstore two blocks down on Sunset called Book Soup, where he had a very nice uh, poetry reading of Jim's poetry over the years with uh, Chester Bennington and uh, Perry Farrell, uh, two contemporary uh, uh, rockers, along with uh, Michael Ford, a longtime friend of Jim's, a childhood friend of Jim's. And so, but the main event was at the Whiskey, where Robbie uh, played the CD box set, uh, and next door at the uh, Cat Club, where uh, Ray was showing off uh, an, uh, a part of an upcoming exhibit at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland devoted to The Doors. And at 11 o'clock, the two of them got together with a band, including Chester and Perry, and also Slash, 
from uh, Guns N' Roses for a mini concert of six songs by The Doors. Slash actually said hello to me. Oh, well, no, I, I, was, I, was very, I was very pleased by oh, that. Oh, good. I thought it was, you know, he's got the guy with the top hat, you know, yeah, Slash sure. is and the real top. rock star. <laughs> this <laughs> is a rock star. This is not some guy, you know, playing. <laughs> this is <laughs> Slash. <laughs> not no chords like that. Yeah. Right. All right. No, sir. And Slash's bodyguard was there. This guy was so fucking big, man. And Slash is a big guy, too. You know, Slash has worked out on some iron. So, you know, when he came by, Slash, hey, whoa, you worked out, man. This guy is standing, I'm playing, and there is a guy standing next to me like this. And he's about 6'5", and he's, and I'm playing, and, and I keep bumping into his belly. <laughs> Never moved, never blinked an eye, played the first song and said to somebody, <laughs> and he got out of the way, you know, it was cool, so he got out of the way, but Slash was cool, everybody was cool, Slash played really loud, really loud, none of this. <laughs> none of that kind of stuff. So Ray, how was it for you to witness, or to be part of, to be enveloped by this incredible crowd scene? All of uh, oh. those two blocks on Sunset were jam-packed. There were lines in front of all three venues. Mm -hmm. There was a line beginning by about 4 p.m. at the Whiskey, and maybe even earlier, uh, for basically an 8 o'clock show. Yeah. There were VIPs who never got in, yeah. which was kind of fun. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it was, he almost, they didn't let I, him, they I were going to let him in. Yeah, I mean, right. he was like the last one in before whoa, yeah. the gate came down. The fire right. marshals were saying, no, no more people in this place. And Ben was just like, Somebody, somebody dragged you through. Was uh, this very tall I got a pump, I got a writer, a writer yeah, here. Right. Uh, press is here. I am the author of the book. Let me in, goddammit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get in. I started. Uh, I was at the Cat Club, the uh, the, the London Fog, and I started at about seven thirty, signing the book and and put my head down and went went to work. Hi. What, to who? Okay. Hi, to who? <laughs> who to? To whom? <laughs> I was there until from like, I swear, 7 o'clock, 7, 7.30 until 10.30, just before we went on. It yeah. was just nonstop yeah. signing. Filled with people, Densmore filled with people. Krieger was in the Whiskey A Go Go. Oh, man. And my brother, thank God, big, my brother Rick, you know, I'm, I'm a big Polak. He's really a big Polak. He's like 6'3", you know, 210, 215, 220, big guy. He was bodyguarding Robbie, and he said that the whole, the table, they were just pushing, people were pushing up against him, and Robbie was in danger of being crushed by his own fans. <laughs> yeah. And in classic Dionysus, you know, Dion, Dionysus is torn apart by the Maenads. The Maenads love and worship Dionysus, but at some point go into a frenzy and begin to tear at him and just and they rip and tear Dionysus to pieces and devour the flesh of Dionysus. <laughs> Very much like uh, we devour the flesh of our God and at communion. But that's a story we won't talk about cannibalism and drinking of blood and devouring the flesh of the God. That was happening two Tonight. blocks down to the Rainbow, Rainbow Grill, I think. Uh, but now, um, besides the books you were signing, to whom it may concern, uh, all night long, or a couple of hours, uh, there was also 600 other books you had signed previously at the Book Soup. They had a, an advance order of like 860 books, of which the doors, all three of them, uh, I'm guessing in separate rooms, signed uh, beforehand, and he sold every one of them in one day. Now, that brings up the question you hate to answer, which is why do you think the doors endure here in 2006, 40 years later? Not just musically. It has to do with freedom, don't it? Well, 
because it comes out of this kind of stuff, you know? And we can still play this today. It's E minor. Uh, any guitar players, piano players. Stick a ninth on there. Ninth is just that F sharp. And you know what? And, and just think you're like in a jazz club in San Francisco in 1955, 56, maybe it's, uh, you know, you're Cannonball Adderley and, and, and uh, the Cannonball Adderley uh, Quintet with Joe Zavinul on piano, Cannonball and Nat Adderley. And they did. It's still as hip, you know, in, in 2006 as it was back in 1956. That kind of jazz kind of thing, and jazz and blues. That's the piano bass. That never changes, man. It's still as valid today as it was back then. So what we're doing is we're, the doors were coming from basic American jazz, blues, uh, some classical things that I brought to it from playing, uh, uh, like the introduction to Light My Fire is definitely a Bach. <laughs> Krieger comes in with uh, a, a song called Like My Fire, the first song he ever wrote. A minor to F sharp. Very nice. Except it had a folk rock thing to it. And, and, and Densmore said, let's make it, you know, it's got to give us a Latin thing. Feliciano, Jose Feliciano heard, and he took it into a halftime. Well, you know that it would be Except we do a double time. Then hard rock into four. A combination of all of those. It's Latin sound, it's that basic blues, it's basic jazz, it's classical, it's Robbie Krieger's bottleneck guitar, Jim Morrison's fabulous lyrics, he's got, my god, the beat lyrics, he's got uh, uh, Tennessee Williams, Carson McCullers, Southern Gothic, American Southern Gothic poetry, French symbolist poetry, you put all of that stuff together, and that's Doors music, and maybe that's why Doors music has lasted, you know? Uh, that's a good theory. Just that, that, <laughs> that bombing together of all of those things. I would accept that. Yeah. <laughs> but also to have the, the gumption, the balls, to just go and do that. Because back then, in the early mid-60s, a lot of the rock fans of the day 
were looking at the pop chart and saying, okay, what's a hit? What's that sound? Oh, surf music. Let's do surf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you went through that with Ravens. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, or uh, it's British time, so now we'll, we'll, have, we'll, we'll come up with a British sound and a British name. Yeah. And we'll climb onto the uh, Liverpool bandwagon. With the doors, for example, now, you were, you were playing Light My Fire, and you came up with that opening uh, uh, stanza. But then you also decided, uh, all of you, I guess, to uh, do this extended break in the middle of it. Again, you're going against convention. Well, we, we, you've got, okay. Here's, here's Jazzer Manseric and Jazzer Densmore. So you've got verse, chorus, verse, chorus. This is the verse. That, and then the choruses. Okay, you've done it twice. Uh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Uh, do you want to do solo? No, 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 you don't want to do that because you've done A minor to F sharp. This is song construction. No, 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 no. So we're coming on. And it was like, hey, John Coltrane. Coltrane's My Favorite Things uh, in four, Coltrane is doing. We're doing. So I'm going to float over the top of that while Lefty keeps this bottom going. You know, he's just, he's good and steady. He loves to do this. And I play. So I just came up with it, just popped out of the unconscious. And we're back into the same song again. So we've got verse three and then chorus. San Francisco, it's always good. Now that I'm up here, it's like, 
Fuck those Dodgers. I hate the Dodgers, That's man. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, okay. I thought I heard even a little bit of Vince Garaldi in there. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, Vince Garaldi. Oh. Then while you're talking about... Uh, absolutely. Vince Garaldi is one of my favorite piano players. And Robbie Krieger said to me, we're doing Crystal Ship in the recording mm. studio. It's time for my solo. And I said to Robbie, I said, I don't know what to do, man. I just don't know what to do. And he said, Vince Garaldi. Oh. I uh -huh. said... Yes, 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 yes. So, you know, the door like is... people did not pronounce that Garaldi. Wow. Yes, Garaldi, yes. Or like Girardelli Square. But while <laughs> you're talking about uh, Coltrane, uh, one of the things I, I enjoyed, a moment I had with Robbie was asking him about Light My Fire, because as you said, he, it was like his second song ever. First for The Doors, based on a Jim Morrison homework assignment. Jim was looking over his portfolio of, of songs. He had a few great ones that he had sung. Uh, tentatively to Ray at the beach uh, in Venice. And uh, so Jim said, you know, guys, we have some oldies, we have my stuff, we need more more songs, can you go home and write some songs? And Re uh, Robbie was the only one who came back with anything, and he shyly offered Light My Fire. But when I asked him about about the song, he said, you know, my inspiration for that, I was, I was trying to come up with something kind of like, kind of like Leaves and Hey Joe. <laughs> hey Joe, where are you going with that gun in your hand? And I said, oh, hey Joe. Where are you going with that gun in your fire. hand? Come on, baby, light my yeah, fire. Yeah, 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 yeah. There yeah. you are. Yeah. So that's where inspiration comes from. I can from. hear it. Yeah. From radio or yeah. from your yeah. musical education. Or never, that never occurred to me. Uh, well, read the book. You'll learn <laughs> <laughs> many new fun facts here. <laughs> uh, yes. okay. I only read my parts, you know. <laughs> yes, all right. Okay. And the Admiral, of course, you have to read. The Admiral speaks for the first time, G. Steve Morrison, George S. Morrison. We, we call him the Admiral. He's just simply referred to as the Admiral, Jim's father. And he speaks for the first time. This guy, you actually sat down with the Admiral and... I, uh, yes, we, we broke bread. Yeah. Yes, right. No, no, what it was was the TV crew in Coronado had already set up the um, uh, interview with the Admiral, and so I just sat in. This was before I had even signed my pathetic deal with Hyperion Books. Um, <laughs> Bob Miller is that Bob Miller. <laughs> I'm not bitter or anything, don't get me wrong. But uh, I, knew all I, work. I knew I'd be that, doing it. Is that all I get? I love the door, so I knew I'd be doing the book, so I went down there anyway. Oh, man. A little train trip to Coronado. And so I met the Admiral and uh, luckily uh, the, the sister, Anne, a lovely woman, yeah. uh, was there to support her father and then she agreed to sit for an interview as well. And she never had before either. And so for the first time we talked to siblings. Uh, Andy, uh, the brother, younger brother, had yep. spoken before for Jerry Hopkins and Danny Shergman's book. But he again speaks with me and uh, shows he hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> he still thinks Jim couldn't sing. <laughs> so, well, well. Way go. He, he, he didn't he, have a good voice. I didn't think he had a good voice. He was no Sinatra. I yeah, it's like, what the fuck, man? Look at this guy, you know, from his own family. I think yeah. the old man says the same thing, you know? Well, he didn't have, like, a Caruso kind of That's voice. Not, yeah. <laughs> well, what rock and roller does? You know anything about rock and it's roll? Bob you... Dylan. Um, we, only, we wanted to uh, leave time for you to ask uh, a couple of questions of Ray's. But yes, we, yes, but, yes, but, 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 yes, but, but before we, we have this that. keyboard, so let's make some use of it. Yeah. What do you say? Keltner Wong was saying that she didn't want uh, just an instrumental of uh, Riders on the Storm. And I, I'd like to respond to everybody who is here, you see. So let's do a, um, let's try a little vocal on it too. <laughs> Killer on the road, his brain is 
time. It's your turn. A couple uh, of questions. Yes, sir, in the back. Questions. Shout it out. Uh, right, Oliver Stone movie, Oliver Stone movie, uh, correct. What do I think of the Oliver Stone movie? Not a correct portrayal of Jim Morrison. He was much more intelligent than he was shown to be. Uh, he was witty, he was charming, he was a funny fellow. He was a poet, he was an artist, uh, he was an intellectual. Oliver Stone took one drunken episode, leaves out all the good Jim Morrison, takes another drunken episode, puts him back to back. But everybody under 40 thinks it's so bitchin', man, so... That's the way I want to be. He, you just drink and write poetry and then you, you know, God, that's, anybody could do it. It's, no, it's not like that. He, he was seduced by alcohol and alcohol eventually kills Jim Morrison. And Oliver Stone didn't get the real psychedelic nature. He's a, he's a white powder man. And I don't think he understands uh, psychedelic, which was really the bitch of it. Here's your chance to make a fucking psychedelic movie about a psychedelic band. For God's sake, do you have any idea what psychedelic is? No, you don't. You're a white powder juicer. Okay, once again, another one. Yeah, your portrayal. What do I... <laughs> I mean, I love, you know, I met the guy, man. He's a real cool guy, Kyle uh, uh, McLaughlin, real nice guy. And I told him, I said, just, you're in charge. Just don't take shit from anybody, including the director. And, of course, he just, you know. <laughs> and I love the line, you knew it was, it, Oliver Stone didn't know what he was talking about when Kyle says to Val, or Ray says to Jim, we're going to make the myth. On the beach, or on the beach. We're going to make the myth, Morrison. We're going to make the myth. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> make a myth. We're going to make a myth, mythological. Jim Morrison is now mythological, but make the myth. And I thought, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. And then the other thing, Jim is kind of with Pam, and he's got two bags of groceries, and he's staggering around. And Pam says to him, Jim, whining at him, what do you want? And he says, oh, nothing, honey, I'm on some low-grade acid. <laughs> now, if you've taken the substance, you know there is no such thing as low-grade acid. There is LSD acid, and there is not LSD acid. There is no low-grade, it's just I had a mild dose of acid. Well, the whole point of acid was to get the most mild dose you could possibly get to get off. And you know, low-grade acid does not exist. And, you know, the movie, it's a lot of fun. He got the name of the band right. <laughs> Val Kilmer. Uh, good Val job. Kilmer's good. Val yeah. Kilmer's very good. The, uh, uh, the music is good. The rock scenes, whoa. The rock scenes are great. So, you know, from that perspective, uh, you know, I dig the movie, but not what he did to Jim Morrison. Yes, sir, right here. What about uh, the scene with uh, the group Love and the Doors? Love uh, got uh, the doors signed to, uh, Arthur Lee got the doors signed to Electra Records. He was the one who said to Jack Holzman, you've got to come down and, and take, a look at, uh, take a look at these guys. These guys are really good. So Arthur Lee, now in heaven, he's in the, he's in the roadhouse. There is in heaven, if you, if you choose to go there, if you want to do this kind of thing, there's a roadhouse on the outskirts of heaven. It's not, in the, it's not in the middle. It's not where you're going, holy, holy, holy. Whoa, the big God, you're so incredible. And God says, thank you very much. Out on the other end, way out there is a roadhouse. And Jim's there, you know, and John Bonham is there, and Keith Moon is there, and Brian Jones is there, and Kurt really? Cobain is, and Jimmy's there, and Janice is there, and, and, and Entwistle's there. They've got a band. You know, uh, every Grateful Dead keyboard player is there. <laughs> where, are, where are the agents? Do they have an office? The, uh, no, the agents are at the bar. They're there. They're in the audience. <laughs> making, making a deal. Making a deal. Making a deal. Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, that's where they are. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. When are you planning on going on tour in New York? Uh, we're going to be on the road. Uh, uh, Riders on the Storm, as we uh, uh, call ourselves now. Me and Robbie and Ian Asbury. Uh, <laughs> Phil Chen on bass. Great bass player. Played with everybody. Our man from Jamaica, Jeff Beck, he played with Jeff Beck and he played with uh, Rod Stewart. And so he's on bass and Ty Dennis, young monster powerhouse, is on drums. We'll be uh, in England for New Year's Eve. What about U.S.? 
I don't know. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, uh, I keep saying, listen, we better play the whole Bay Area here, man. Or I'm going to have people killing me, you know, because oh, up in Napa, when are you going to play around here already? So, Napa hope yet? <laughs> you don't go to a club there and just jam a little bit? I could, huh? Yeah. I could do that. Yeah, but they no, they want the whole band. They want the whole with Ian singing. So maybe in the summertime, what we're what we're going to do is I think Europe in the winter, um, you know, in a couple of weeks from now, then down to South America for uh, um, a couple of gigs down there. So we're going to play like 10, 12 gigs, take two months off, go down to South America, two months off, then maybe play the states in uh, the summertime. So. Hopefully we'll be we'll be somewhere here. You know, I don't know where. Whether we'll be at the Fillmore, uh, the Warfield, uh, the, the what's the para the old Art Deco uh, place, the Paramount. Yeah, yeah, I like to play there because that's a nifty auditorium. Yeah. Yes, sir. Your music in Go Along with CD, Better Made in the Paint, is exceptional, and your recent performance at the Throckmorton Theater in Mill Valley was incredible. As Thank well. you, brother. And uh, it's funny to hear about Europe because this DVD of '68, when you co-headlined with Jefferson Airplane, yeah. so I was wondering what was the interaction like working together with Jefferson Airplane on the on the tour? What was it like? Well, Paul, uh, uh, you know, Paul is the uh, uh, the crazy Catholic boy, and so am I. <laughs> so uh, Paul and I got along just fine, and I uh, uh, we had a lot to talk about. And as a matter of fact, I played with Paul maybe about five years ago, and I mentioned to him, I said that we talked about high school. And I said I went to Saint Rita High School in the uh, uh, in Chicago. Saint Rita is the patron saint of the impossible, <laughs> <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> and Paul said Saint Rita. St. Rita, and he, he's in his pocket, and he has these cards, and he pulled, he's got like a half dozen saint cards, and he said, here, here's a card of St. Rita. And I said, wow. holy shit, that's impossible. <laughs> well, whoa, wait a minute, man, that is impossible. So Paul and I got along just fine. I mean, he's, he's, he's really a good guy. And uh, on the tour, Jim and uh, Grace did the old in-out, in-out. So, <laughs> well, they didn't really. You can't. No, no they didn't. They didn't. Grace, when did Grace said she did. She, in her book, but she needed to uh, justify her million dollar advance. Oh. And so she had to tell some stories, not only out of school, but out of uh, reality. <laughs> she has since admitted that she made it up. Oh. Really? Sorry. Oh. Sorry, Grace. Sorry, Jim. <coughs> yeah. All right. Was, Who cares? I, 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 yeah. <laughs> believe what you want, what I say. I'm going to believe that they did the in, out, in, out. All right. Go ahead, man. Uh, albums, what, what music have I been inspired yeah. by? Boy, oh boy, the whole world, you know, I mean, uh, just everything, I mean, just everything out there, you can, uh, I just, I just went over uh, up the street to, uh, uh, what is it, Amoeba. 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 <laughs> Emboya. Iboga. Iboga. I went to an Iboga record store. Anybody know what Iboga is? Iboga root, Africa. Ibogaine. Iboga. So in, anyway, I bought the new back two African records and a uh, electronic uh, by some group. I can't their name escapes me, but I've got one of their CDs. And a so, piano CD. I listen to everything, man. You know, it's all. I mean, it's all out there. China, you know, and South America. Samba. Got to do samba. You know, as far as uh, contemporary uh, guitar playing rock and roll bands, uh, I hear them on the radio, so I don't have to buy anything. You know, Franz Ferdinand comes and goes, and. Franz